Father God in heaven, you are great. You are mighty. You are awesome. You are reigning. You are ruling. And we praise you, Father, that you're all glorious, all beautiful, almighty. And your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is our Lord and our Savior, seated at your right hand. He is our salvation. And Lord, there's nothing more we can ask for in this life than to you to be in our hearts, to be in our lives, and for us to be surrendered to you, Lord Jesus. This is the essence of the Christian life, living for you. God, thank you that you are ruling and reigning, and you are great, and you are magnificent. In the mighty name, your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. All God's people said, amen. Amen. You may have a seat. You may have a seat. Here at uh, Calvary Chapel, we go verse by verse through the New Testament on Sunday mornings. And then on Wednesday nights, we study the Old Testament verse by verse. So we see the big picture. But today, I'm taking a break. I'm taking a break from our, our verse by verse study of 2 Peter. And I want to have, a, I want to have a special message for July 4th in honor of our nation's birthday. Because this is an awesome day that we all celebrate. So, um, happy 4th of July, everyone. Happy 4th of July, yes. 245 years. 245 years we have been a nation. And we need to celebrate that. We need to celebrate that. And we need to remember the principles that our country was founded on. And, and the faith that has been uh, steady. Um, throughout the godly saints throughout the past 240 years that have brought this country to where it is today. So today, we celebrate the birth of our great nation, the United States of America. I'm going to give you a brief little history, and I want to give you some quotes to talk about the, the founding of our country. It was on June, not July, it was on June 11th, 1776, that a committee of five men led by Thomas Jefferson, began the task of writing the Declaration of Independence. It was only a month they really worked on it, the, the meat of it, they worked on it for a month. And then on July 2nd, 1776, the Continental Congress made the final decision to declare independence from Britain. And then finally, on July 4th, 1770, 70, 1776, excuse me, the Continental Congress, after the final changes were made, approved the final Declaration of Independence. Once all the required signatures were made, the Declaration of Independence was circulated throughout the 13 colonies and eventually delivered to um, King George of Britain, declaring America's independence from the tyranny of Britain. And the lie today, the, this, this, this most spread throughout our country, the lie today is that America was not founded on Christian principles, that America was not founded on the Bible. And that is just simply not true. That's just simply not true. Our country, the United States of America, was founded on the Bible. Thomas Jefferson said this, and I quote, the Bible is the cornerstone for American liberty. Patrick Henry, in addition to saying, give me liberty or give me death, our country, he said, Patrick Henry also said, our country was founded on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Founding fathers like Noah Webster, who wrote the first dictionary, could literally quote the Bible, chapter and verse. James Madison said, we've staked our future and our ability to follow the Ten Commandments with all of our hearts. George Washington said, uh, it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, and to be grateful for his benefits, and to humbly to implore his protection and favor. Of the 55 men who formed the U.S. Constitution, 52 were active members. There it is. 52 were active members of their local church. The Bill of Rights, which is the first 10 amendments of the Constitution, give us what? Those three things that we all love, the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, and the freedom of worship. Our country, our nation, our founding has been blessed. 
We have been blessed as a country. We have been blessed by Almighty God to live in the land that we, that we live in today. That was 245 years ago. And over the course of 245 years, a lot of things have changed since then. The Bible has been banned in public square. Prayers have been removed from school. Sexual immorality is an accepted way of life. And the religion of today is self. We, as a people, talking about people in general, we have become our own golden calf. You know, we, we've taken God off the throne and we've put man on the throne. And family, that's just wrong. We can't do that. We can't trust in ourselves. We can't trust in our way of thinking. We can't trust in our philosophies. If we do, we're, we're doomed. But if we will trust in the word of God, founded on the principles of scripture, we can and we are a great nation when we follow his word. So what does the Christian do? What does the local Christian do living in Columbia, South Carolina? There's this temptation for all of us that we see all the darkness around us and there's a temptation to just pack it up, wait for the rapture, and to say, I'm out of here, check out. But that's not what the Bible teaches us to do. The Bible does not teach us to just pack it up and wait for the rapture. The scripture says you and I are to be salt and light. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 14, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt becomes tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Family, Christ is talking about you and me. He's talking about you and me. And we are to be the salt and the light. What does salt do? Salt preserves. We, we are the salt. We are to preserve the world from going rotten by interjecting our faith, Christian, and biblical values into every single part of life. It's that Jesus says, you are a light. You're the light of the world, a city set on a hill. We are called forth to shine the light of Jesus Christ that's dwelling on the inside of us to those around us, to our family, to our friends, to our co-workers. We are called to shine our light. So the title of my message this morning is The Duties of Every Christian Citizen. And first thing I would like to do is I would like to cite my sources. About four months ago, I was given this little booklet by Bill Bright from Campus Crusade for Christ. And it was uh, uh, your... your your duties as a Christian citizen. So my, the source for my message this morning is the scriptures, my studies, my reflections this week. But I pulled a lot from Bill Bright because he, he does an excellent job talking about um, Christian duties um, for every, uh, the duties of every Christian citizen. So that's the title of my message, the duties of every Christian citizen. So I want to give you uh, five points. The first point talking about us being Christians, is we need to understand this, that you and I, believers, we are dual citizens. We are dual citizens. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, the apostle says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, you and I hold a dual citizenship. You and I have a, a citizenship in heaven and a citizenship here on earth. Which one should come first? Heaven. Heaven. When you leave this life, how long will you be gone for? Forever. For eternity. At best, Lord, give me 70, 80, 90, 100 years. But this citizenship here on earth in the United States of America will one day end. And if there's anything, this, if there's anything that's important in this life, and that is your eternal salvation. Where will you spend eternity? You can spend eternity in heaven by being a citizen of heaven. How do you become a citizen of heaven? By putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and becoming a Christian. In 2 Corinthians 5, 8, Paul says, To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When you leave this life, you will step into eternity and see God in all his glory in a place called heaven versus the alternate, which is hell. So, 
our, our dual citizen, we have dual citizenship, and our citizenship is first and foremost in heaven. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making his appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. You and I are here on this earth to represent Jesus Christ to a fallen and broken world. You and I are God's spokesman to this world. The Bible, do you know the Bible has an audible voice? It does. That audible voice is you and I speaking forth its truth. Do we see our life that way? Do you see your life here on earth as that you are a representative of Jesus Christ? That you are, yes, you're an American citizen, but ultimately, in the bigger picture, you're a citizen of heaven by, by nature of your, by, by, by you being a believer in Jesus Christ. And we need to understand that. We need to view life that way. We need to live with an eternal perspective in life, knowing that we represent him before we represent all things. So that's the first point, is that you and I are a dual citizen. The second point I want to make to you this morning, talking about um, our, our duties as a citizen, is we are here to evangelize. We are here to evangelize. It is our job as citizens of heaven to tell others about citizenship in heaven. That's our job. That's our job here on this earth, to represent him and to evangelize. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, many of you know it, the Great Commission, where Jesus says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's our job, believers, to point people, as citizens of this great country, to point people to God's truth, to God's word, and to God's salvation. It is our job to share the gospel. Our lips is how the proclamation goes out from the scriptures, from our lips, to people's lives. So we're here to evangelize. We love our country. We stand with the red, white, and blue. And we love our flag. But ultimately, we know our purpose here is, a, is an even higher calling than being an American citizen. And that's being a citizen of heaven that is here to evangelize, to reach out to the lost, and to minister Christ to other people. Number three, the third thing that we need to understand as citizens, as American citizens, and our Christian duty, that we need to pray for our country. We need to pray fervently for the United States of America. We need to be, family, on our face, on our knees, praying fervently for our families. I'm going to talk about the government in a minute, but I want to talk about your personal sphere of influence. But first, we need to be praying for our families, our churches, our pastors, our neighbors, our communities. We need to be praying fervently for the mission of God on the earth, which is to reach out and praying that people completely commit their families to serving Christ. Pray for our churches that they are com completely committed to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Pray for our pastors. Please pray for me. Pray for all the area pastors that we preach the word and that we share the gospel with people. That's what the things that, that you can be praying for as an American citizen and being a Christian. We need to pray for revival. We need to pray for an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit that God's spirit would sweep across this land and that men and women would turn to the true and living God. I'm fixing to quote a verse that many of you heard on July 4th in days we talk about our country and our nation, but uh, it's, it's, it's quoted very, quite often. And that's 2 Chronicles 7.14, which says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Now, we need to understand this verse, where it's at in its context. This verse that I just quoted to you that many people quote, it was a covenant promise to the nation of Israel. Now, we're not saying America is Israel. Matter of fact, we'll, say that, we'll, say, we'll make it clear. America is not Israel. But I like what John MacArthur says about this verse in his commentary. On 2 Chronicles 7.14, John MacArthur says, and I quote, 
this covenant blessing can apply to Christians. Galatians 3.29 says, If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. He says, All the promises of salvation, mercy, forgiveness of sin, and spiritual prosperity are ours to claim as we are faithful to God. End of quote. Again, the people of God today is the body of Christ, not America. But as we, the body of Christ, family, churches, believers, as we pray, as we repent, as we spread the gospel, as we stand for the truth, what can you and I expect? That God will move mightily in our land. You know, we don't have this deistic view of God. He's way off in outer space and he's left us to ourselves. No, we don't believe that. We believe that when we, re- we pray, when we repent, when we evangelize, when we share the gospel, that the Holy Spirit comes and impacts the world. That's what we believe. And I believe that that's the essence of this promise made to Israel a long time ago. Uh, Peter said in, in the book of Acts, he says, repent that times of refreshing will come, is what he, is what he told the, uh, Israel. I think it's in Acts chapter 2 or Acts chapter 3 there in his sermon before the, uh, the leaders. But we have to ask ourselves, are you and I, are we, let's examine ourselves for a moment. Are you and I doing what this verse talks about? Are we humbling ourselves? Are we, are, are we letting go of our pride? Are we getting low before God? Or we're saying, oh, God, we need you. We need you greatly in our world. I need you in my family. I need you in my life. I need you to move mightily. Are we getting low? Are we praying? That word prayer means words are coming off our lips and out of our heart, and they're going up to the throne room of God. Are we praying for these things? Are we seeking his face? Seeking his face through prayer. Seeking his face through worship. Seeking his face through Bible study. That's how we approach the Lord. That's how we interact with our great and mighty and awesome God. And I believe when we do these things, we can expect to see changes in our world. You can expect to see changes in your life. When you pray, when you repent, when you humble yourself. And then he says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, are we doing these things? Are we turning from our wicked ways? You know, I examine my heart weekly. And I'm like, oh God, help me to rid myself of the evil actions. Help me to rid myself of the evil thoughts. You know, some streamer thoughts go through your pastor's head sometimes too. Did they ever go through your head? Some evil, wicked thoughts that you would never share with no one? I have them. And I go to my study and I bow my head and I pray to God and I say, Lord, please remove this from my thought. Please remove this from my memory. Please help me not even to meditate on the things that are wicked. I believe it's when we have that aggressive approach to our faith that we see real change in our life. And we see real change in our families. And we'll see real change. So this Number three, this third principle, you pray for your country. I, when I was preaching on that point, I'm thinking about families. I'm thinking about churches. I'm thinking about pastors. I'm thinking about yourself. I'm thinking about neighborhoods. I'm thinking about community. I'm thinking about revival. But my fourth principle, my fourth principle is very important. And this is really the thesis of Bill Bright's book, Your Duties as a Christian Citizen, is this. As American citizens um, who love the Lord... Do not, I repeat, do not give up on government and politics. Do not give up on government and politics. And here it is. Here's the, here's the point. Number four, be informed, be involved, and be in the know. Let me repeat that. When it comes to politics and the government and what's going on above us, we need to be informed, be involved, and be in the know. The Caesars in the New Testament times, Tiberius, Gaius, Nero, Domitian, They were known for being wicked, ruthless, violent men 
who commanded to be worshipped in the first century. They promoted and they led lives of sexual immorality. And their sexual immorality and their debauchery spread throughout the entire Roman Empire, okay? The New Testament church was completely enveloped in this darkness. And listen to what... uh, Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. He says, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and reverence. We need today, Christians, we need today, believers, We need to pray for our political leaders. We need to pray for our president. We need to pray for our governor. We need to pray for our leaders. And more important than even the decisions they make, we need to pray for their salvation. Okay? They are souls. Even though they're high and mighty in their their positions, they are souls that Jesus Christ died for. He loves them just as much as he loved, loves you. He died for them just like he died for you. And we need to pray for their salvation. And then after their salvation, we need to pray that they will fear God and they will make godly decisions when making laws. I want to give you some uh, verses from Proverbs. Proverbs twenty nine sixteen says, When the wicked are in authority, sin flourishes. The godly will live to see their downfall. When the ungodly officials are in office in our land, wickedness and evil will be promoted. It will spread like gangrene. And who pays the price? Society. Society pays the price. Our families pay the price. And our children pay the price. But, and, when, and, and when sin and wickedness flourish... First, Proverbs 29, 16, in the middle of it says sin flourishes. When sin and wickedness flourish, what are we left with? We're left with darkness. We're left with sin. We're left with immorality. And what does that produce? That produces people that are broken by sin. People that are broken by sin. And what is the fix? The gospel of Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ Christ. When, when sin and wickedness, wickedness flourish and we, and we don't repent, we don't turn from our wicked ways, there's only one sure thing that's left, and that is God's judgment. So do not, I repeat, believers, do not ag- abandon government and politics. Be informed, be involved, be in the know. Ignorance is not bliss. It's actually a sign that you don't care. British statesman Sir Edmund Burke said this, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and women to do nothing. And that can't be said of us. We need to do something. We need to play our part as American citizens to influence our country with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or as as Jesus said back in Matthew chapter 5, be the salt and light. Proverbs 29.2 says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. You know, we want happy people. We want a land of rejoicing. We want a land of rejoicing, and we don't want people that groan. So when it comes time for elections, you, need, you have duties, you have responsibilities as, as part of your rights in being able to vote. You need to know the candidates. You need to know You need to do your homework. You need to know their positions on the important issues. And as a Christian, you need to vote based on your Christian values. That's one of our duties. That's one of our responsibilities. You know, if you don't vote, you don't play a part, and you don't like the outcome, well, don't complain. We all have to play our part in in being the salt and light in this world. And the fifth and final principle, which Bill Bright does a wonderful job in his booklet, Um, of bringing out is this in every decision in everything you do in how you live your life and the choices you make in even who you vote for in in everything you do here it is the principle 
make God the issue. Make God the issue. Don't make Calvary Chapel the issue. Don't make you the issue. Don't make anything the issue except God and God alone. Let it all be said and done for his glory and for his honor. That's our aim. It's not about politics. It's not about one party or another party. It has nothing to do with that when it comes down to vote. It comes down what matters to God. That's the Christian view. What lines up with Scripture? You know, we have to ask our questions. We have to ask questions when we're making decisions in life when it comes to government, life, and, and society, and, and, and our citizenship. The first question we need to ask is, this decision I'm fixing to make in any of those areas, does it honor and glorify God? Does it honor and glorify God? That's the first question. And if it doesn't honor or glorify God, we shouldn't do it. We should not do it. Or we should not support it. Every decision you make, every decision you, should, you make in life, Christian, should start with this. Should start with this one question. What does the Bible say? When you're making a decision of who to vote for, where to work, who to support, who to do, you know, all your, the politics and being a citizen, we, we need to ask the question, what does the Bible say? Because Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised from the dead, you shall be saved. You need to understand in the first century, to confess Jesus as Lord was a death sentence. Because back in that day of the first century, there was one Lord, and that Lord was Caesar. And to confess Jesus as Lord, you are defying the law of the land and saying, no, Caesar's not Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. It, the other thing is, we need, we need to let God and his word be at the center of our life. Again, this is not a political speech. Uh, I, I don't care about politics. I don't care about parties. I care about what does Scripture say? What does God's Word say? And I, and I apply this a principle to everything in life, to my marriage, to my children, to my citizenship, to my being a pastor. That's the ultimate question. It, 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 that's the ultimate principle is God, I want you at the center of my life. Don't stand idly by. Let your voice be heard. Be involved in your community as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. And always, 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 always remember, our loyalty is to the Lord Jesus Christ because our citizenship is in heaven before it is here on this earth. Christians do not bow or obey ungodly laws. We call this civil disobedience. You and I need to be the very best law-abiding citizens, bar none, unless the laws tell us to go against God's law. And at that point, we say, no thanks. We're going to obey God rather than man, as Peter said in the book of Acts. We do not, uh, we do not bow or obey to ungodly ways of life. If the Scripture prohibits it, then we prohibit it. If the Scripture permits it, then we permit it. It's called living a Christian life. It's called having a, a, a biblical world view. That's, that's, that's why we come to church. That's why we study the Bible. So that, one, you can get saved. That's number one. The first reason is you come to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You learn about Jesus. You learn he died on the cross. He rose from the grave. And you come into this personal and living relationship with him. And you become saved. But then after that, we study the scriptures so that we can have a biblical worldview, so that we can see the world through the lens of Scripture. Christians do not bow or obey policies that destroy the moral fabric of our nation. Again, our allegiance is to, is to the Lord and to Him alone. And in all decisions and in all matters of government, politics, life, voting, church, everything is all about God. It's all about his word. It has nothing to do with no political party, no skin color, um, none of that. It's for God's glory and him alone that we found, we make all of our decisions on. 
So the fifth and final principle, the duties of every Christian citizen, is to make God the issue. So family, understand these five things. And if you want to learn more about them, I recommend getting Bill Bright's book, uh, Your Seven, Your Duties as a Christian Citizen. But you're a dual citizen, and your citizenship in heaven comes before your citizenship on earth. You are here to evangelize. You are here to share the gospel. Boom, there goes another minute, gone forever. Go share your faith while you still have time. That's what Ray Comfort would say. You know, and we need to take, take advantage of every opportunity we can to reach out to people and share the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive you of your sins. He offers you eternal life, but you have to do two things. You have to repent and believe the gospel. And when you repent, turn from your sins and put your trust in Christ, he will come into your life and he will save you. That is our message. That is the message of scripture. Uh, we are to pray for our country. We are to pray fervently for our country. We're to pray fervently for our families. We're to pray fervently for our walks. You know, we are to be people of prayer, repenting, getting low, and humbling ourselves. And then finally, uh, don't check out. Don't, don't climb up on the mountain and wait for the rapture. Don't go up in the woods and, and wait for the rapture. Let's be informed when it comes to government, politics, and our society and our neighborhoods and our, our schools and our civic centers and all that. Let's be informed, be involved, and be in the know. Let, let's, let's be, uh, what is it, uh, wise as serpents, but what, innocent as a dove. Let us be that way. And in all matters, as a U.S. citizen, let's make God the issue. And there's, I want to close with this verse, Proverbs 14, 34. Um, it's just a magnificent verse. It says, righteousness exalts a nation but sin is a reproach to any people. The Bible tells us, okay? The good book, as some people would say, it tells us what will lift up our nation. It tells us what will lift us out of the despair and the gloom that we're in. What is it? According to Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness. Righteousness is a big, long theological word that simply means a right standing with God. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I know, I know, it's, it's banned in schools, it's banned in the public square, and it's very hard, but you and I as Christians can spread this righteousness, can spread this gospel within our sphere of influence and our works, in, in our work, in our home, and in the places that we go. Because this is what will lift people up. Righteousness exalts a nation, and we understand that sin is a reproach to any people. You need to understand this sin... It brings darkness. Did you know that? Uh, what is sin? 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Sin is transgression of God's moral law. The, first, uh, the fifth commandment says, honor your mother and father. That all may go well in your life. Honor your, that's, a, that's the fifth commandment. When we disobey mom and dad, we are sinning. The ninth commandment says, you shall not lie. When we lie, that is a sin. The seventh commandment says, you shall not commit adultery. And I, when I first saw, I saw that commandment, you know, for some of us, we say, oh, praise God, I've never committed the act of adultery. But Jesus said in the Gospels, he who looks with lustful thoughts commits adultery in his heart. Guilty. The, the sixth commandment says you shall not steal. When we violate God's moral law, that brings darkness. That is what sin is. Have you kept the Ten Commandments? Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a Christian and you want to understand what the gospel is. You want to understand, you say, Pastor David, give me the gospel in three minutes. Here's the gospel. Would you consider yourself to be a good person in God's eyes? Would you consider yourself to be a good person? Be honest. Yeah, I would consider myself to be a good person. Or no, I wouldn't. Well, to understand if you're a good person, ask yourself, have you kept the Ten Commandments? Have you kept the Ten Commandments? Have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen? Have you ever blasphemed? Have you ever used God's name in vain? Have you ever dishonored your parents? If you're honest, if you're honest with yourself, you're just like me, and you're guilty. 
When I examined myself in the light of God's Ten Commandments, I found out that David Ford, in God's eyes, apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, was a lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterer at heart. That was my verdict. I was guilty before God's holy and righteous law as a sinner. I was guilty. And then I had to ask myself, well, if God gives me justice on judgment day, would I go to heaven or would I go to hell? I'm guilty. God is good. God is perfect. God is righteous. God is holy. I knew off the get-go, I deserved hell. So what, so maybe you're here and you're like, man, I, I'm, I'm guilty of break. I'm not a Christian, but I'm guilty of breaking those laws. And you ask the question, well, what did God do so that I could be forgiven? That's the big question. What did God do so that you could be forgiven of breaking God's moral law? The Bible says at the appointed time, God sent forth his son, born of a virgin, lived a sinless, perfect life, and suffered and died on the cross to forgive you of your sin. See, that's why Jesus died on the cross. It wasn't for life enhancement. It wasn't so you could experience God's wonderful plan for your life. It wasn't so you could have lasting happiness and joy and peace and all that stuff. He died on the cross to forgive you of your sin. And how do I partake of that? How do I partake of salvation? How do I receive that forgiveness? Uh, the scripture describes salvation like a coin. That coin has two sides. The first side is repentance and the other side is faith. Repentance simply means I turn away from my sin. I, I turn away from lying, lusting, adultery, living in darkness. I turn away from sin and that's repentance, turning away from it, leaving it, and I put my trust in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's the righteousness that will exalt this nation. That men and women would, as, as, as he said, Mark, Jesus said in Mark chapter 1, would repent and believe the gospel. Have you repented and put your trust in Christ and received him as your Lord and Savior? It's repentance and faith. Turn from your sin, put your trust in Christ. Based on your faith in Christ, God will grant to you salvation. That is the gospel. And that is what will lift you out of darkness. And that's what will lift this nation out of darkness. Is you and I being citizens of heaven, spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father God in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this day. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you work on the hearts of us all, Lord, helping us, Lord, to love our country by loving you more and placing you first in our life. And Father, if there be anyone here this morning that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, and they want to be forgiven of their sin, I pray, Lord, that you would give them the courage to slip their hand up right now with all heads bowed and eyes closed and us praying. If there be anyone here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and today is the day that you want to give your life to him, today is the day that you want to repent and believe the gospel, I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up so I can pray for you. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, I pray, Lord God, that you would work in our hearts and draw each and every believer here closer to you by your grace, by your truth, and by your great love that you have for us. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And Father, we also, we love our country that's broken right now. And Father, I pray, we pray, we pray, we humble ourselves 
And we ask you, Lord, to use us as instruments of peace, as instruments of righteousness. Lord, the divide this almost in every area of our country. Help us, Lord, to bring righteousness in, to bring healing in through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to lift up our nation by inserting Jesus into the equation, inserting righteousness into our conversations and influencing those around us. So Lord, we love you and we praise you and we thank you that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Lord, strengthen our faith, increase our faith and our walk with you. We love you and we praise you and we thank you for the independence and the liberty that we have in you. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen.